and that might give you some information for the career development project right if you go to that uh, you can even put in the career development project. I spoke to the transfer person at this event and da da da, and this is what I found out. Uh, so this is what I'm going to do, type of thing. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at slideshow here, and uh, let's talk about Chapter 11, capital budgeting. What happens? Um, we had in our Chapter 8, right? Was it 8? No, 7 forget the chapter we did budgeting we did our operating budgets right and we did our operating budget and at that time I pointed out that that was going to be looking at just a single year of the business right what would our operating budget be for that single year what we're going to do today is we're going to say well what happens if I'm looking at projects opportunities that extend beyond just the current year how am I going to make decisions as to whether or not I want to make those longer term investments okay and one of the key factors here that we're going to have to get used to is this idea of the time value of money and present value accounting so we are going to have to learn about present value accounting to be able to do these problems and do these uh, things on the exam but once you get used to present value accounting it's actually uh, pretty easy for you to do by considering present value, we are able to compare dollars that we're going to pay out today versus dollars that are going to be paid out several years or a few years out into the future. And so to be able to evaluate those dollars in the future, we have to make them equivalent to today's dollars. So we call that present value accounting, and we do that so we're comparing apples to apples and making these decisions. Okay? What is this green flashing now? forget about it I think that means the recording is going to cut off on me is that what they're trying to say hello hello <laughs> let me see I don't see any warnings or anything. It seems to be recording, so I'm just going to go for it. If you see that green stop flashing, tell me. Maybe that means something. Okay, from current slide. Okay, so when we're talking about what? When we're talking about our longer term uh, type projects, we're talking about plant expansion, uh, equipment that we're going to purchase, equipment that we're going to replace. Should we lease something? Should we buy that item? Um, where Should we uh, take an approach where we're trying to reduce our costs by investing in some more efficient equipment? All of these are the types of decisions that we get into when we talk about capital budgeting as opposed to the operating budgets that we talked about in that earlier chapter, which went for a single year, essentially. Okay? So... We're going to see that um, we're going to be screening decisions, and screening decision is basically seeing if a proposed project meets some sort of minimum standards that we may have set up, and we're going to really study uh, three different sort of uh, um, goals, if you will, thresholds, if you will, is probably a better word, um, that we'll be looking at when we're deciding on a decision. One is the payback period. The other is the net present value, and another is the uh, rate of return that we're looking for on a particular project. Okay. The other thing that we'll do, and we'll do this towards the end of the chapter here, the end of the slide presentation, is we'll also be considering uh, different alternatives. Should we invest in machine one or machine two? Should we buy a new machine or should we keep the old machine? So we're looking at projects individually to see if we're going to accept those through those screening decisions. We're looking at projects, what, side by side to see which one uh, provides us the best alternative. Okay, and these are the two type of things that we do with capital budgeting. Okay, so again, I, as I said, we'll study the payback method, we'll study net present value, and then we'll study internal rate of return. Internal rate of return is sort of a hurdle that we set up for ourselves and we'll accept projects that will exceed a certain internal rate of return and we will reject projects um, that do not. 
Um, we can also use, because you look at internal rate of return and you say, okay, well, that sounds like then just evaluating the screening for a particular project. Can we do that? Can we do comparison with internal rate of return? And what we'll see is that we could calculate the rate of return on different projects. And if we have different um, alternatives, we'll select those that have what? We'll select those that have the highest rate of return as long as they are exceeding my internal rate of return. Okay, okay. so let's just go ahead and let's take a look at the considerations. And we're going to considerate, consider cash outflows and cash inflows. You see the cash outflows up here that come with the project, including repair and maintenance, the initial investment. If there's any incremental operating costs as a result of this investment, that's going to be considered a cash outflow. Working capital is considered a cash outflow. What does that mean? Let's say that I'm going to make a decision to lease a piece of equipment, okay, in this whole decision. And as part of the leasing of the piece of equipment, I need to make a deposit with the vendor because the vendor is going to sit there and say, hey, I'm not going to just let you tear my equipment to shreds and then you try to give it back to me. I want an initial deposit so that I know that I'm going to get at least some of my value back in cash. So they make us give a deposit at the beginning of, say, a four-year lease. I have to give them, say, $10,000, and they're going to hold that $10,000 until the, what, four-year period is over, and then they'll release it back to me, right? Well, that's a working capital tie-up for that four years. Remember, working capital is current assets minus current liabilities, and we pretty much think of this working capital as cash. So when they say working capital outflow, we're talking about the cash portion of our working capital, right? Okay. Okay. So those are all cash outflows. Cash inflows are going to be what? Let's just start with incremental revenue, just to take a look at that and see what that means. Incremental revenue is saying, look, you're making this investment because at the end of the day, you're thinking what? There's going to be a tick up in my revenue by having done this, right? So what's going to be the increase in revenue? Of course, we'll have to do what? We'll have to do present value of that because those revenues are going to come into the future. What are my cost reduction. If I invest in a new machine, that machine is potentially more efficient than the old machine. And so what's going to happen? There could be potentially a cost reduction associated with that. My repairs, et cetera, shouldn't be as much. Then what? Salvage value is going to be cash inflow. If I purchase a piece of equipment and at the end of the five years, I can sell that piece of equipment for $10,000 and that's money's going to come back to me, isn't it? Okay, and then release of working capital. Again, if I lease some property and I had to make a down payment of cash, that down payment would be released at the end of the four years, et cetera, right? Okay, any question on that? Cash inflows, cash outflows. Now, we have to consider the time value of money. We are going to have to calculate present value, okay? So let's say... Um, Let's say you don't like me. I know you have to really use your imagination for that, right? Let's say you don't like me. Oh, no. Uh, so let's say you don't like me, okay? And I say, hey, can I borrow some money? What are you going to say? You're going to say, no. I'll say, well, look, 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 look. I'll pay you back in two years. Come on now. And you don't like me, right? You, so you say, well, what's in it for me? Why should I let you hold $200, whatever I'm asking for to borrow? Why should I let you hold that money for two years? I get nothing out of it. And then you turn around and, you know, you give me the money back at the end of the two years? I don't think so. Now, look, if you like the person, you might go ahead and do that, you know. But uh, the more money they ask you for, the less you like them, right? Okay, so even there, you start to get into a situation where you might say, no, are you crazy? You know, I call you bro all the time, but I ain't going to let you hold 10 grand for a couple of years, right? And so what happens? You sit there and you're feeling instinctively that there is a value to what? Having money now in your hand versus what? Having to give it up and wait for a couple of years to get that money back, right? Okay, so there is a time value to money, right? So what happens? Let's say I come to you and I say, hey, let me borrow, you know, $200. 
And you say, no, I don't know you. I don't care, you know, care about you, whatever. Okay. And I say, well, <clears throat> I'll tell you what. I know you don't like me, but I'll give you interest on that money. So if you loan me $200 today, how about I pay you back $250 in two years? And you say, no, no, okay. Okay, look, I'll give you $300 back in two years. Now you're thinking about a little bit more, and we can make this ridiculous. I say, well, let me have 200 now, and I'll give you a million in two years, right? <laughs> then you're sitting there, and you're like, oh, you're knocking everybody over to loan me the $200, right? Okay, so what happens? There is absolutely a what? A point where you will give up your money now for a return in the future, right? Okay, this is all called the time value of money. And so what we do is we sit here considering that and we'll come up with the present value of amounts that are going to come in the future. And the present value of amounts that are going to come in the future are always less than that amount today. They're always less than that amount today. Think about it, right? $200 that you have today is worth more to you than what? $200 in the future. So $200 that are going to come in the future are going to be less than $200 today, aren't they? You weren't willing to sit there and give me the 200, were you? And just take 200 back? You're saying, no, this money's worth more than to me now than it would be in the future, right? So if I want to see what that $200 is worth today, I have to come up with the present value, and that present value is going to be what? Going to be less than $200, isn't it? Right? Okay. Just like, um, so let's just go ahead and let's take a look at um, this IV type value of money and that will discount cash flows, okay? So we're going to be talking about the discounted cash flows, and we call them discounted cash flows because what? $200 in the future is worth less than $200 today, and so what happens? We will discount that $200 to get that present value of it. It'll be less than $200, and we're going to see that we're going to use tables to come up with that. Okay, so let's first talk about payback method. Now, payback method ignores present value. And we're going to see that this is a um, disadvantage of the payback method because it ignores present value. A advantage of the payback method, it is very easy to use. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look. And what we're going to try to figure out is what is the period that it'll take for us to recoup our investment. That's basically all we're doing with the payback method. So we come over and we take the total investment that will be required for this project, whatever it is, we divide that by the, and we call it undiscounted. When we don't discount it, when we don't consider time value money, we call that undiscounted. We will divide that by the undiscounted cash flows and that will allow me to determine how long it's going to take me to recoup my investment. Okay, So you take a look at this example. And we have this uh, piece of property that we want to invest in that's going to cost us $140,000. There's a 10-year life, and it's going to generate annual cash inflows of $35,000. Now, management puts up a screening. Remember we said we use these for screening purposes and management puts up a screening of sitting there and saying that they're not going to accept a project if it takes more than five years to recoup the investment. So we're going to screen this project to see if the payback period is what? Is less than uh, five years and if it is we'll accept it. If it's uh, five years or less. If it's more than five years we'll do what? will reject this project, right? So we go ahead, we take that investment, 140,000. It's coming from that previous slide. Pick up that investment, 140,000. We divide it by the annual cash flows, which were 35,000. 140,000 divided by 35,000 means it'll take us four years to recoup our investment. If management insisted on what? Five years, will we take this investment? Okay, we would absolutely take this investment because we wanted it uh, in five years, and this is coming back in four years. Okay, 
Again, shortcoming of the payback method did not consider the present value. We assumed that 35,000 four years, five years from now is just as valuable as 35,000 this year, right? So we did not account for time value of money. That is the huge shortcoming of the payback method. The strength is it's easy. It's quick. We can almost do this on the back of a piece of scratch paper somewhere, right? And figure these out. So you should enjoy payback method questions on your exam, right? If they're easy as well. Okay. So let's just go ahead then and look at this slide now where uh, one problem with payback is what happens if the cash flows are uneven. Well, if the cash flows are uneven, the analysis is not ter uh, terribly more difficult. It just simply means that we're going to have to uh, do a little more than just divide by an, a, a steady stream of annual cash flows like that 3,500. We'll have to analyze the cash flows a year at a time. So if the cash flows are coming in 1,000 the first year, zero the second year, well, we don't get any uh, time lapsing off for that zero year, and then it picks up again, 2,000, 1,500, how would we figure out the payback period that way? Well, if you look at this investment, $4,000 investment, and uh, we show how the cash flows are going to come in in years one through five. So first year we get 1,000, so now we've got 3,000 to go to recover our investment, right? Next year we don't get anything, so we're two years in. We still have, what, 3,000 to go? Next year we get two. Now we only have 1,000 to go. Next year we get 1,000. Now we've recovered that $4,000, and so we can go ahead and accept this, assuming that there was a five-year required payback period, but we were able to calculate the four, right? So a little more cumbersome than the other, but not typically more... Uh, difficult right instead of doing one division you have to look at these cash flows one at a time year by year okay okay good so with all that let's go ahead and let's take a look at a couple of the quiz questions and for this chapter I haven't included all the quizzes as part of the slides just because I mean, it gets a little bit redundant here for us to sit here and do three payback method questions. But you do see more of those in the actual homework file, which is posted up on Canvas, the quiz file that's uh, posted up on Canvas. But let's just look at this one. We have this uh, uh, phrase at the beginning, ignoring income taxes in this problem. The reason they're ignoring income taxes is this. If I sit there and I'm generating income off of this potential investment, okay, if I'm sitting here and I'm generating income off of this investment, I clearly have to do what? Pay tax on that, don't I? Right, so um, we're ignoring that, okay? Because what we're really looking at is cash flows here. They're going to come out, and we have to consider cash flows. If I'm doing this for a cost accounting class, I'm making you deal with the income tax, right? Here in this class, I'm not going to make you deal with the income tax, okay? But just keep in the back of your mind that typically, if we're doing this for real, we would be doing what? We would be sitting there and looking at our after-tax income, right? Okay, to get to our cash flows, but. Uh, we come over and we have our sales minus our variable expenses, less our fixed expenses, and they show us both our uh, fixed expenses for cash and our depreciation expenses. Now, the reason we're separating out depreciation in these problems is does depreciation use cash? Does depreciation use up cash? Depreciation does not use up cash, so when we're figuring our cash flows, we're actually going to add that part, the what depreciation part of our fixed expenses, back to our net income, right? Okay. So we go ahead. We have our what? Our net operating income, which was given here, 112,000. We add back the depreciation, so the annual net cash flow, again ignoring taxes, is 150,000, right? Okay, so what's going to happen if we're initially asked to invest 
300,000 in this investment, you come down here to the bottom, 300,000 divided by the net cash flows of 150,000 gives us what? Two years necessary to recoup that investment, right? Would you do this? Really depends, right? Really depends on what the criteria is that they've come up with for time to recoup their investment. If this was a computer, would you do this? If you're thinking about buying a computer and it was going to take you two years to recoup the investment, would you do it? I'm thinking maybe not, right? By the time you get around to recouping the investment, you got to buy another computer already, right? With its computers, you know, start to get obsolete pretty quick, don't they? If we're talking about what? A house, you know, a building, an apartment building or something, two years, and then what? After that, the next 30 years that are left on that building, 50 years that are left on the building, you're doing what? You're getting a return on that investment, aren't you? Now, the problem here is we're ignoring time value of money, and so you say, oh, okay, great. So I'm going to make a return on my investment for the next uh, 50 years, so let me go ahead and do this because this is a great opportunity. I pay it off in two years, and I, re I recoup my investment in two years, and I um, have the next 48 years to make money. Yeah, but if you put your money in the bank and got a 1% interest rate on it, you would also be able to you'd recoup your investment in zero years and you're going to get a return though although it's very low right so we're looking for investments that are going to do better than just putting money in a bank account right okay okay good so we go ahead and we calculated though this answer was two years okay notice here we have this required rate of return of 10 percent um i could give you a problem on the exam in which I'll sit there and I'll give you the same exact problem where we're asking payback, but then I'll turn around and I'll turn this into what is the net present value of this project, and if that's the case, then what? You'll need to use that 10% because now we're giving you that because we're going to consider the time value of money. If it's payback, you have to know to what? Ignore that 10%, right? We don't consider time value of money with payback. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. Again, no income tax uh, considerations for these in this class. And they tell us that Buy Right Pharmacy has purchased a small auto for delivering prescriptions. The auto was purchased for $28,000 and will have a six-year useful life and a $4,000 salvage value. Delivery prescriptions, which the pharmacy has never to, uh, to deliver, Prescriptions, which the pharmacy has never done before, should increase gross revenue by 32,000. The cost of these prescriptions to the pharmacy will be 25,000 per year. The pharmacy decides to depreciate all assets using straight line, using the payback method, and you simply do what? You take the gross revenue minus what? Minus the cost of the prescriptions. Notice they set you up to try to calculate depreciation, which is irrelevant for the what? For the payback method, so we don't need to consider the depreciation. So we're going to have net annual cash inflows of seven thousand. Initial investment of twenty-eight divided by the seven thousand gives us a four-year payback period, right? If you're waiting for deeper meaning, stop. That's all the payback period method does is how long is it going to take me to recoup my investment, right? Again, the ease, the, uh, the benefit of payback is what? Ease of calculation, okay? The downside is what? Ignores time value of money, okay? Okay, good. So that's why uh, we will probably want to consider the net present value method. Okay, with net present value method, we're going to discount our cash flows and we're only going to accept those um, investments that have a zero or greater net present value because at that point we have considered whatever the required rate of return is in discounting those cash flows. So if we have a negative net present value, reject the project. If we have zero or positive net present value, what? accept the project, right? Did I say accept both times? Reject if it's negative, 
except if it's zero or positive, right? Okay. Okay, good. So we're going to, of course, look at our cash inflows and outflows, but now we're going to be considering what? Present value of those cash inflows and outflows. So we come over, again, positive or, they don't say zero, but positive or zero net present value. I'll let you finish that text message because I know it's very important so that um, you're able to concentrate on what you need to know for your exam. I noticed some people, because I got on them about uh, texting, just decided not to even show up to class. So that's getting really smart, right? Let me text while I'm here. When the guy yells at me because I'm texting while I'm here and he's yelling at me because I so happen to put a question the teacher did that's going to be an exact question that's on the test. Yes, when I pointed that out to the person, I knew I had a question that was an exact question that was going to be on the test and the person's gone. <laughs> okay, then what? They miss the question that's going to be the exact question on the test. Uh, so let me win the battle by now not even showing up. So that when the exact question is going to be on the test, I'm not in the room. Right? That sounds like a winning strategy. Okay. Maybe I'm just more upset because Hillary lost, okay, than I would have been by that. Okay. So anyway, what happens? We sit here and we look at what? We look at positive net present value or zero. Even though they don't mention zero here, here we'll accept the project. Negative, we do what? Negative, we reject the project, right? Okay. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this specific example here where they give us information and we have cost of special equipment. We have the required working capital that's going to be tied up. Now this I'm looking, you know, if we're buying the equipment, what would be the working capital that would be tied up? I don't know. Maybe we need to uh, have some filters for this stupid thing, right? And so what's going to happen? They make us put a deposit uh, down so that they can hold that working capital so that we can have the filters for the machine. I don't know. Whatever. It happens, okay? There's working capital tie-ups are 100000 relining the equipment in three years. So this is going to be a cash outflow as well if we have to do some sort of major overhaul to the equipment after three years. We have to reline it or whatever. Salvage value in five years is 5000 That's money that's going to come in. Of course, our sales for these parts that we're going to make from this machine are inflows cost of the parts sold is an outflow salaries and shipping for this whole project is an outflow right so we're going to sit here and we're going to job one turn these all into present value and then job two is going to be to what net out the cash inflows versus the outflows and see what uh, if we have a positive net present value on this okay so let's just go ahead and see how we'll do this and notice they use a discount rate of 11%, okay? Discount rate of 11%. That is sort of like their required rate of return on this is 11%. And by discounting these cash flows at 11%, we're seeing if they're meeting our hurdle, right? They're meeting our threshold. If they're meeting our criteria, our screening level, right, that we talked about, that's 11%. So should we accept it? Answer is going to be yes if the net present value we're going to calculate is what? positive or zero no if it is what if it is negative right okay so let's just go ahead and let's take a look and uh, the first thing she does is sit here and compare what compare the sales revenue minus the cost of goods sold minus the salaries for the shipping so we come up with our net cash flows right revenues minus expenses okay then what then we come over minus cash expenses then we come over and we start using present value. Now look, the initial investment of 160000 and the tie-up of the working capital, we use a one factor for that. There is no present value because those are going out today. They're already stated at present value, aren't they? Okay, so those go out at one. Then what? Then we come up and we take our net cash flows, which that lady calculated on the last slide, and so that was 80000 and we come up with the present value of that by going to the present value of an annuity factor. 
an annuity is considered a stream of payments that have an identical amount. So in years one through five, we're going to have what? This net cash flows of 80,000. So it's not just one payment, it's several payments, isn't it? And if that's the case, to pick up the factor, you have to go to present value of annuity factor. So taking a look at this table, did I show you guys this in uh, the other class? 1A, 101A? I can't remember if I did or not. Okay, so here's these tables here. And there are two tables that you need to consider. One is a present value of a dollar. The other is present value of an annuity. Okay, and you need to figure out which one you're supposed to use. Now, you look at present value of a dollar a present value of a dollar payment. Let me put this in tablet mode. I can get rid of these. Okay, present value of a dollar factor is what is considered one payment. A single payment gets to be redundant. I'll call it one what type of payment? Single payment? One single payment. Okay. Now, if you notice here, guys, for all of these different interest rates that are given in these problems, all these different interest rates, notice that what? All these numbers are less than one, aren't they? Aren't all the numbers less than one? at all interest rates you keep going through the table all the payments are what are less than one and the reason they're all less than one is what that one payment in the future is what worth le worth less than what that payment if you had to make it today right Okay, so all the payments, are, all the numbers are less than one in the what present value of the dollar table. Now, in the example that we were just looking at in the book, we had several payments, didn't we? We had what? What was it? Five payments? Essentially, that eighty thousand was like five payments coming in. Our net, our net cash inflows is like payments coming into us. And how many were there? There were five, right? So what do I do? I need to come to the second table that you need to consider here. And that second table is called present value of an ordinary annuity. Ordinary annuity considers end of year payments. Considers end of year payments. When they say ordinary annuity, that's end of year payments if it says annuity due that's beginning of the year payments in this class we'll deal with end of year payments okay so we have what we have annuity and the way I can quickly tell if I'm on the right table or not is notice that what for the first payment if it's just one payment you could call that period slash payments if it's one payment Notice all the numbers are less than one. Well, look, one of the things that I'm going to talk to um, President Trump about is I'm going to ask him, okay, I'm going to say, hey, one of the things that you can do to make America great, great, period, not again, is get rid of this row on the um, annuity table because if it's one payment, it's not an annuity. So they shouldn't even have that that row there. That one payment is a single payment, isn't it? In fact, I probably shouldn't have crossed it out because, um, well, it's okay that I crossed it out. But if you kind of look through the haze here, you can see that the one payment row on the present value of the annuity table is the same numbers as what? As the one payment row on the um, present value of a dollar table, isn't it? Because it's one payment, so it's really not an annuity at all. It's really a single payment, isn't it? But then after you get past just one payment, notice that what? All the numbers are greater than one, aren't they? Because what? We have more than one payment. But if you're at the two payment level, notice all those numbers are what? Are 
less than 2 because 2 payments in the future are worth less than what? Than those 2 payments now, right? So to get the present value of them, it's going to have to be less than 2. But notice, other than that one table, that one row, I should say, all the numbers are more than 1, right? So if you're ever confused, you're like, am I on the right table here? If it's an annuity, if it's several payments, you go to the what? Present value of the annuity factor where all the numbers are greater than one. If it's what? If it is a single payment, all the numbers are less than one. You'll be on the present value of the dollar table, right? Okay, but for this one, we needed to go to the present value of the annuity table, didn't we? And it was five, how many payments? How many years on that? Five years, the interest rate was what? 11%. So if I look for the intersection there, I get this 3.69590. Is that the number I get? Yes. Okay. And so you come over and you look back now at the uh, example. Is that the factor? They didn't carry it out that many decimals, but that was the factor, wasn't it? Okay. Is that the factor? Okay, so I go ahead and I take that 80,000 times, oops, I don't want that, oh, yeah, that's right, I can't write on it when it's, so, oh, so, from current slide, And so it's 80,000 times this, what, 3.696 gives me the present value of those future cash payments. Right? Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and we have what? We have the realigning of the equipment, which is going to be a one-time payment that we're going to have to make in three years, right? So we go back to the tables now. And when we go back to the tables, sounds like some sort of like uh, medieval. Back to the tables. Okay, so anyway, we don't watch too much TV, I guess. Anyway, so we come back to the tables, and we have what? We have our present value of a dollar, the one payment table now that we go to, right? And it was how many years? It was three years, and our interest rate is what? 11%, isn't it? Isn't that the interest rate we're using? So we get this factor 0.73119. And so you come back to the example now, and there's that 0.731 um, that we multiplied. Again, they're not carrying these out as much as the uh, decimals on this table. But there gives us the present value of that single payment, right? Okay. Okay, good. Then we come over, and I'm just going to advance the... Uh, Stay in, uh, not in slideshow mode, so I can go back and forth to the table easier. They have the salvage value. The salvage value does what? Comes back to us, comes to us one time, doesn't it? And the release of the working capital gets released one time. So we go back to the present value of what? Of the dollar table. Again, I'm going to show you how to do that because you're going to have to get used to figuring out how to do this. And it's how many... Um, how many years are we going to have to wait for that? Is it five years? Five years, and we have a what? Interest rate of, uh, oops, of 11%, 0.59, yeah, 0 0.59, 0.59345. Okay, and so we come over and we take a look. And is that the factor they used? Okay, and it works the same for the working capital. Notice the working capital initially had come out today at 1, but when the working capital is released, that's five years from now, so we have to discount that to present value, don't we? And I'm not going to go back to the table. It's the same factor, right? Okay, okay, good. So when we finish this thing up, we're sitting here and we're seeing that we have a present, uh, a, a net present value of what? Of 76,000, 
0.015. Do you want this project? Do you want to do this project? How many want to do this project? Four people want to do this project? Okay, everyone wants to do this project because what? Positive net present value, right? If the present value was zero, we would still take it. If it's negative, what? We're not going to accept this project. Okay? Okay, good. So positive net present value or zero, we do what? Take the project. Negative, we don't take the project, right? Which is this slide right here. Okay? Okay, good. Um... Internal rate of return. I thought I put some questions in here. Yeah, I did, but I kind of stuck them in the wrong place. We'll get to, we'll come back to talk about internal rate of return in a minute. Um, let's go ahead and let's take a look at uh, this example, and then I'll have to go back. I think I just put the slide in the, the, the slides, the question in the wrong place, okay? So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this one. And, uh, what happens? We have initial investment of 360000 That initial investment is coming out when? Hello? Coming out now. So we don't, we never discount the initial investment, right? That's just whatever it is, 360000 Then we have an annual cash flow of 118000 they tell me expected life of the project is four years, and then they tell me that uh, we have a discount rate of 12%. Now, the way they did this pro this uh, analysis for that 118,000 guys, and I don't, I wouldn't do it this way. Uh, have you do it this way on the test? For some reason, they decided to do what? Discount the cash flows one at a time. Notice all those numbers are less than one, so they went to the present value of the dollar table and discounted them one at a time. The only time I would do this is if I had uneven cash flows. If I had uneven cash flows, then I'm going to have to, what, do them one at a time like this, right? But if I have even cash flows of 118000 I should go to, what, present value of annuity table, shouldn't I? At 12%. At, uh, so I come over, I think I'm just remembering that some of these questions for some reason go, they go beyond what the table does. But I'll have to find another table, so you might have to wait for that. But let's go ahead and let's take a look back at the table. And we're at what, 12%? Uh, so we need to go to what, present value of? I'm just showing you an alternative way of doing this. Present value of the annuity table at 12%. How many periods? Four. Four periods. So I'm going to, somebody please write down. I'm going to take 3.0373 3735. Somebody got that number? Okay, thank you. Okay, and so I come over and now what? Let me just go back into slideshow mode. From current slide so I can do the calculation. I'm going to multiply that 118,000 by what? 3. Zero three seven three five. you say? Yeah. Okay. All right, good. So if you take the 118,000 times the 3.0375, you get what? Three hundred and fifty-eight thousand four hundred and seven. You say? Yeah. Point three. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So when I do that, then and I take these present values instead of this three hundred and sixty thousand, and you've got a couple of things going wrong here. The reason the number doesn't match exactly is what they are using discount factors. Remember, they use what? the shorter discount factors instead of the more drawn out ones that we're using. So we're using a more exact number and then they did them. Well, it should make a difference that they do them one at a time. The one at a time doesn't make a difference, but the fact that we have more numbers in our decimal is what's driving this difference. Okay. And so what we're getting, what, 358, 
this number for us is what three five eight four oh seven thirty hello okay so that's going to be a subtract here so if you take three hundred and sixty thousand which is the amount that was paid out today and you subtract three hundred fifty eight thousand four oh seven you get One thousand five hundred ninety-three, you say? Is that what you got? Five ninety-two point seven. Pretty good. My computer to the left here. Okay, <laughs> so what happens? You sit here and you get pretty much the same number. A little bit different. Again, it's rounding, but what? It's clearly not changing the decision, is it? Okay, so we got a little bit of a difference in rounding here because they're using a shorter uh, present value number, but it's still, it's a negative number. Are we going to accept this project? Not going to take this project, right? Now, sometimes students will say, well, that's only 15. That's pretty close. Okay, well, you don't have to sit there and insist on this, you know, 11%. You could sit there and say, well, I'm clearly not getting 11% return, but I'm getting close enough to my return that I'll go ahead and do it. Or you could sit there and rank projects starting with what? The one with the highest net present value, and you just pick them off, and maybe you do start to accept some negative ones that aren't too negative as you um, go through your different, you know, projects that you're making decision about, right? Okay? Okay. So it's not like God comes down and says, you can't do that project because I have a net present negative net present value. But in t classes here, we sit here and we do what? We sit there and we, uh, you know, are absolute about our decisions all the time. Uh, but we, you know, in business, we'd have a little more flexibility. Okay, good. Come over and let's take a look at another net present value calculation. Okay, and you've got more of these in your homework, but let's do one more. Okay, so we've got this uh, Beaver Corporation is investigating the purchase of a new threading machine. Cost of the new threading machine is 18000 That money is coming out what? Now. So we don't have to discount that, right? The machine would save about 4000 per year. Um, over the present method of threading component parts and would have a salvage value of 3,006 years when the machine would have to be replaced. The company requires a 12% rate of return. And so what are we going to do? This one, notice for what? For the 4,000, to get the present value of that, they did what? they went ahead and they multiplied it times the present value of the annuity factor, didn't they, for the 4,000? This is the weirdest looking presentation I've ever seen of something like this. Oh, I see. I'm going to evaluate it this way. I got it, I guess. Okay, anyway, we'll calculate it up here. I'm trying to look at this table and figure out what are they trying to do with this table. Looks to me like they're trying to confuse us, okay? But I'm going to take that 4,000, and the 4,000 times what? 4.111, okay, is going to give us a number. Now, let's just go ahead and let's see what we get on the table. What table should I go to? Present value of an annuity. There's the present value of annuity. I know I'm on the right table because all the numbers are what? More than one. How many uh, years? Six years. So I come to six years. Interest rate was what? 12%. There's my 4.11. 41. Okay, let's just go ahead and put in 4.11141, just so we see how the rounding affects it. 4.411, what was the last two numbers? 4.1, okay. Okay, good, and when we do the multiplication on that, we get what? Sixteen four forty-five, you say? Yeah. 
0.64? Okay, good. So we've got what? We've got the, uh, what was it, 18,000 coming out now. We've got the present value of those cash flows coming in at what? 16,445.64. Okay. Anything else? Anything else needs to be considered? We got the salvage value coming back, don't we? Okay. So we pick up that salvage value coming back, which is going to be 3,000. Okay. 3,000, but that's a one-time deal, isn't it? So 3,000, and I know you guys know how to use the tables now, but let's just practice. So, come back, find my table. Which table should I should I use this one or the the dollar table? Dollar table, right? Okay. And so I go to the present value, of the dollar table, and it was tell me the interest rate again. It was twelve percent, and it was how many years? Six. six. So it's what point five zero six three three. Is that the number there? Okay, so I come back, 0 0.50633, come back. What was the number? Okay, hang on, let me get back and I'll just write it. 0 0.50663. Okay, times 3,000 gives me what? 1519 and how many cents? 89. 89 cents. So that money's going to come back to me as well, isn't it, on a present value basis? 1519.89. What was good about 1989? The Oakland A's won the World Series in 1989. Okay. So what happens? We sit here and we have what? Huh? That's right. It was also the earthquake. <laughs> okay. So what happens? We have this what? 18,000 present value comes out minus what? And that just comes out at one minus the present value of the cash inflows, or I guess maybe you're adding them because it's already a negative number, right? However you want to look at that. Okay. So we've got this amount coming back, this amount coming back. What's the net present value of that? Negative $34.47. So we get a slightly different answer. Again, that's because of the rounding. Okay. And so what happens? Are we going to accept this project? Technically, no, but it's pretty small. It's getting close. But look, if we've got a, you know three or four other projects with a nice big net present value, then we'd probably do what? We'd probably grab those off, and then it's not until maybe we're getting down to some of these that have a negative or zero or lesser positive, smaller positive net present value, right? We could certainly rank the projects that way. Okay? Okay. So that's not too bad. Why am I ending the show? I want to go back, right, to a couple things that we've said about internal rate of return, okay? And then we'll go past those questions, and then we'll go through the rest of the slides here for internal rate of return. Now, what internal rate of return is is this. We use this, and this is probably a better ranking mechanism for projects, and that we're going to see what the rate of return is on this and we will only accept those projects that exceed what the company has set up as their internal rate of return as their hurdle rate for projects now it's going to turn out that those projects that give us a zero net present value will have met our hurdle rate those projects that what that give us a negative net present value will not have exceeded our hurdle rate right Okay, so um, we're going to accept those only if they exceed our hurdle rate. And again, we could evaluate our projects by listing them in, in descending order from the highest internal rate of return to the lowest if we're trying to evaluate between different projects. Okay, so again, internal rate of return is the rate of return that causes our net present value to go to 
zero here, right? Okay. Now we come over and we will accept a project if it equals or exceeds our hurdle rate, our internal rate of return. We will reject a project if it what? Does not exceed our internal rate of return or, or meet it. Okay. Okay. So we come over and we already looked at these. I didn't do this one, did I? No. It's more of the same, guys. I'm not going to sit there and make you do another, you know, round of 15 rounds with the, with the tables, okay? But you can practice with these here. And, again, I put the homework file up. And we'll be going through more of these, you know, as we head towards our final, okay? All right. So let's just go ahead and uh, let's take a look at this internal rate of return. They're trying to decide to buy this. What is this? A smog uh, Machine looks like the smog machine, right? That they have at the uh, garages, whatever. Okay, and they're trying to make a decision if they should invest in that. Okay, now the machine has a 10 year life, which is irrelevant here. A uh, company can purchase a new machine at a cost of 104320 that will have 20000 per year net cash operating cost. And they want us to see. Um, whether or not we want to keep this project to see if it will exceed or invest in this project to see if it will exceed a certain internal rate of return. Now, if you notice this right here, we have the what investment required divided by the annual cash flows. So we kind of get a number that looks like the payback period, don't we? Doesn't that kind of look like the payback period? Yeah. Okay. But there's another way to look at that number that comes out of this as something different than the payback period. So what happens? If we sit there and we take a project, which is going to be the annual cash flows, And we multiply that times the present value of the annuity factor, assuming we're only looking at projects that have, you know, a stream of equal payments to consider for this particular example. And we multiply that times the present value of the annuity factor. What do we get here? The same answer as what? What do you mean the same answer? Huh? We get what? We you know say what you said the first time you said it exactly, the first thing you said. We get the net present value of these annual cash flows, don't we? Or at least we get the present value of the cash flows, don't we? Right? Isn't that the present value of those cash flows? We take the annual cash flows times the present value of the annuity factor. We get the present value of the cash flows, don't we? Hello. Okay, okay, good. And so what happens? We will accept a project when the present value of the cash flows, and remember, it would be both the cash outflows and the cash inflows, but if that number is zero, we accept the project, don't we? If the net present value of the cash flows is zero, the amount coming in, the amount going out equals zero, will give us a zero net present value, right? Okay, and so if that's the case, then if this number is supposed to be zero and we want to figure out what this present value of the annuity factor is, then what we're going to do is we're going to set that annual cash flow times the present value of the annuity factor. equal to the investment because the investment is coming out at a at one isn't it the investment comes out at one okay so if we set the annual cash flows times the present value of the annuity factor equal to the investment then that's going to give me a present value of zero right because i discount the net cash flows that gives me the present value of those what do i have to pay out now we don't discount that that's what at 100 percent if that number equals zero or is what 
positive I'll accept the project, right? And we said our internal rate of return is going to be the factor that causes this project to have a zero net present value, right? So now I go ahead and I do what? I simply do the algebra, and when I do now, for this particular problem, it was the annual cash flows were what? 20,000 times the present value of the annuity factor. had to equal and the initial the initial investment was how much in this example 104,000 okay and so now to do the algebra to get the what present value of the annuity factor I simply divide both sides by 20,000 don't I and when I divide both sides by 20,000 do I get what I sit there and I get the Factor, present value of the annuity factor, right? What's this spaceship landing look thing going on here? Or you're all thinking about the election still or something. What's happening here? 20,000 times the present value of the annuity factor equals the amount of the investment, doesn't it? And if those, if that number, the net cash flows and the present value of the annuity factor equals that number, that'll make the present value of this project zero, which will have a net present value of zero, which is going to help me to calculate the internal rate of return, right? Okay, so then what happens? Then I come over and I just do the algebra dividing each side by 20,000. That gives me the present value of the annuity factor, doesn't it? So I've got that number, and now all I have to do is go over to the present value of the annuity table. And here, I'm just giving you a slice of the table because the stupid tables that I have in here don't go up to 14% for some stupid reason. Okay, And so I'm going to use this one here, but it's 10 periods. Interest rate is what? 14%. And so the rate of return on this is 14. Uh, it comes in the 14% column. So the rate of return on this is 14%, isn't it? So we kind of use the table backwards, right? Okay. So we got the internal rate of return, didn't we? And again, if that internal rate of return matches what the company is looking for or is more than what the company is looking for, we'll accept that project. Or again, I'm thinking internal rate of return is real useful for us in that what? In that it'll probably help us to rank the projects, right? Okay. So what table did we go to, Steve? Which table were we on? Okay. Step one is being in class. Step two is staying awake. And I know that it's hard to do both of those, but if you try, you might actually get a better grade on the next midterm or on the final. Okay. All right. So you come over and you take a look at, um, that's the same thing, isn't it? Okay. Okay. So let's try this one. Um, expected annual, let me see something real quick before I get all frustrated with myself. Okay, we should be able to do this because it has a rate that's on the, on the uh, table. Yeah, okay, very good. Okay, so what happens? We're sitting here and the expected annual net cash inflow is 22000 over the next five years, right? The inquired investment uh, now in the project is 79310 what is the internal rate of return? Who wants to set this up for me to begin with? When you go through these questions, guys, you got to be careful. Omar, I'll get, we'll, we'll do it right now. I'm going to call on you to do it. I know you can set it up. Um, when we set them up, guys, when, when you look at these questions, here's a mistake that a lot of students make with these questions when you get on the test. You just memorize. Divide the amount of the investment by the cash flows. That'll give me the, um, the factor that I need to use, right? That's a mistake because now you're using up brain power for memorizing something when you could be what? Tapping into that brain power, utilizing your understanding of the material, right? Okay. And so what I would rather you do is set them up to sit here and say, okay, go ahead, Omar. Okay. Well, I don't know. Set it up for me. 
79,310. In fact, set it up for me with words. Initial investment, right? Wait, wait, wait. Initial investment has to be equal to what? Okay. Initial investment is going to be what? The annual cash flows, right? Times what? Times the present value of the annuity factor, right? Omar? Okay. And the reason I'm asking you to set it up this way is because, look, I don't know that they're not going to make me give you some stupid problem where you have to figure out the what? The initial investment or something like that, right? And if you sit here and you just memorize, divide this by that, and that's all I need to know, and then all of a sudden they ask you for the initial investment and make you work, jump backwards to the hoop, you sit there going, oh, the wording of this question was so difficult, right? So if you run into a question where you're doing this, you set it up like that, and then it's much easier to sit there and pull the elements you need out of the question to be able to answer it, right? Right? Okay, now this one was sort of set up where, okay, so what's the annual cash flow? 22000 And that's going to be equal to the present value of the annuity factor, right? Okay, good. So now I'm going to do what? Take 79310 Omar, and divide it by what? which is where you wanted to start this whole thing. 3.605, you say? Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the table. Okay. And I come back to my little table over here. You want me to use present value of a dollar or present value of an annuity? I come to the present value of the annuity. How many years on this project? Five years, so I come down to the five year, and I use what? Twelve? What was it? Twelve? Per, uh, oops, I got to find the factor. Sorry, I know it was twelve percent because we saw the answer already. And I come down, and the factor that is the closest here is what? Three six zero four seven eight. Right. So in this question, it works out pretty close to because they, they don't round theirs, but it works out pretty close to what, this 12%, which is the answer for this question? So that's 12% here? That's what we came up with pretty much using that factor. Pretty close, right? Okay, and so we go ahead and uh, sure enough, the answer is 12% here. Okay, and they didn't round out their factors the way we did. Or they rounded their factors out, right? We didn't. Okay. Okay, good. Um, how about this one? Who wants to set this one up? Oh, look, it's right here. 178,000 divided by 36,000 gives me 4.968. I go over to the present value of the annuity factor, and if we rolled along how many years? Eight, Eight years, we would find something that's pretty close to this factor. Want to practice it? No? Don't want to practice it because what? Practicing it would make it uh, make me too good at it, and I want to I want to introduce an element of uh, in, intrigue when I'm on the test, right? I want to feel shaky about my skills, so I get more excitement out of it. Okay, so let's go ahead, and all that means that I'm going to make you practice it. So let's go and back to the table. Okay. And we go back to the table, and we're picking up this 4.968 for how many periods? Eight years, okay. Eight years 
right there. And we've got what? 4.9. Okay, there we go. We knew it was 12% because we saw that, right? Okay, so these tables get pretty easy to use. Now, on the exam, they'll give you a chunk of table, okay, and you won't have to have the whole table. They'll just give you a slice of the table, enough of the slice to confuse you if you don't know what you're doing, and enough of the slice to allow you to get the right answer if you do know what you're doing. Okay, okay, good. So you come over and... Um, Let's do a little bit more with this net present value. Ah. Stupid thing. Stupid me. I hit the wrong. I wanted this end part. Unless you want me to start all over again. Because this is so interesting. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and let's just look right here. From current slide, please. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this. Uh, now, if we're going to evaluate two projects, we're going to pick the project that has what? The greater net present value, right? Or two options. It doesn't necessarily have to be two projects. It's two options. Because in this example, the question is going to be between keeping the old machine and buying the new one. Okay? So we go ahead and we have the new car wash, the old car wash, okay? The annual revenues, I guess we'll get more from the new car wash because I guess it can wash more cars more quickly or everybody wants to go to the new car wash, right? Whatever, it's causing us to generate more money. It's going to have a little extra operating cost because I guess, you know, there's some super duty, heavy duty electrical use of, you know, electricity for the soap dispensers or something. I don't know. And so we have the net cash flows are a little more for the new car wash, right? Okay. So we come over and we say, okay, well, what's going to happen? Cost of this thing is 300000 Productive life is 10 years. Salvage value is 7000 At the uh, end of six years, we have to replace the brushes on the car wash and uh, what? And then uh, we'll be able to salvage the car wash for $40,000 at the end. So that money will come back to us. So we're going to sit here and we're going to come up with the initial investment, $300,000. We're going to have to replace the brushes at the end of six years. We're going to get what? Annual cash inflows of $60,000 a year on that. Um, the $60,000 is coming from right here. Okay. And so we're going to get the annual cash flows of $60,000 a year. And then what? Then we're going to get the salvage value of the old equipment is 40000 And um, did they give us this? Oh, yeah. The salvage value of the new equipment is what? 7000 So we'll get that out at the end. So the salvage value of the old equipment when we sell, we're going to get that now, right? Okay. So the net present value of buying the new machine is 83202 right? Now we're going to compare that to the net present value of keeping the old machine okay so we go through the same analysis now for the old machine if we keep it we're going to have to pay 175,000 to remodel I don't think you remodel a car wash maybe upgrade or, or renovate <laughs> whatever and then what and then overhaul maybe and then we're going to have to replace the brushes anyway on that one even after the remodel of 80,000 right okay so we come over and we go through and now again, the 175,000 for the uh, overhaul comes out now. The 80,000 to purchase the new brushes comes out six years from now. And our net cash flow on this is 45,000. And that net cash flow of 45,000 came all the way back from what? From here, where the money was being made for the 45,000, right? Okay, so we go ahead and again, we're seeing if which one gives us the bigger. Buying the new machine is 83,202, and what keeping the old gives us a present value of what? 56,405. So what are you going to do? Buy the new, right? Plus you get a new machine. You get to bring all your friends over and say, hey, check out my new car wash, right? Okay. Huh? 
Exactly, right? That's your friends or the people you want to come use that thing. So you make that in cash flows of 60000 whatever it is, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, one of the things that we don't get into in this class is if we were really doing this for business purposes, do we know we're going to get 60000 a year? We don't know. So what you could introduce to this that you'll start to get into when you start doing um, – they call them decision science type classes that for your business degree they make you take. You start getting into probability analysis. So you'll take the same thing that you've learned, but then you'll start to get into, well, what's the probability that we'll get what? That we'll get the 60000 or what's the probability that we'll get some amount more, and you'll come up with the expected value of what it is that you're going to get off of that, and then you'll use that in the analysis as opposed to just using this 60000 number. But uh, that comes in later where you start doing probability analysis. But other than that, um, you'll be doing something very similar to this in some of your other classes. Okay. Okay, good. Now we have something called simple rate of return, and the key word in here is simple, which is doing what? Taking my annual incremental net operating income, dividing that by my initial investment, and that gives me my rate of return on this thing, a very simple calculation, right? You might do that sort of, you know, just quick and dirty. Okay. Huh? The uh, annual incremental net operating income? I mean, what is it incremental? Incremental means the difference by taking the option. So if my net income was 100000 and by taking this project, I'm going to have 150000 of uh, not income, net, uh, net operating income, my incremental is 50000 Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. So they give me an example here. Cost is 140,000. We'll generate incremental revenues of 100,000 and incremental expenses of 65. So my net incremental is what? 45,000? Right? Or 35,000? 35,000 is my incremental. Okay. And so I'm going to go ahead and do what? Take that. 35,000 divided by the 140,000 initial investment, and I get a what? Simple rate of return of 25%. I mean, this is almost a nonsensical analysis, okay? But because it ignores what? Ignores time value of money, ignores is there any kind of payback period? I mean, there's a lot of things that are being ignored here, right? Okay, good. So there's your favorite person. Huh? It's chapter, supposed to be chapter 11. It's 13 and it's 13 in another class. Okay, question. Question. Okay, guys, you will see that there are some additional questions. Um, up on canvas for these so um, I will probably include those that we haven't worked so far uh, for this chapter in some of the sort of practice exams that we're going to have later on but starting Monday we are going to begin the process of going through what practice exams are going to be more heavily skewed towards the earlier chapters building our way back up getting ourselves you know in prime shape for the final this is the last chapter. Now we're in review mode, okay, till the end of the class. Now, listen, don't forget that I have that attendance sheet on you. I've made one with the dates across it, so it is very easy for me to whip that out at any point in time and know that you're not here. And if you start disappearing act on me, I'm going to drop you from the class. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to keep you engaged because I've learned the hard way. And you may say, no, come on, man, just let me float away and I'll be okay. And I'm telling you, that's not how it works. Accounting is like weightlifting. And if you don't do it, you can't lift the weights. If you do it, you stay in as good a shape as you are now, right? 
Okay, so you got to get over here and you got to work with this stuff. Your dates for your time for doing that is Monday and Wednesdays at 10 o'clock, right? You get through that from 10 till whatever, 12. You put in your workout for that day, right? Okay, and then all you need to do is get in that, uh, you know, game shape for the day of the final and you'll be in good shape. All right? Question? No, just on the last chapters. Whatever, not the last chapter, the last <laughs> chapters, whatever it is, 6 to 11. They here, for some reason, they don't make the managerial accounting exam comprehensive like they do the uh, financial. No, they're not, but I'll put them up. Okay, I'll get them up there for you. Yep, I'll put that on. And don't forget, for people that came in a little bit later, guys, hang tight. If I hope I didn't, I think I closed that thing, but hang tight for a second. Um, you probably want to go to this career in business thing. What's the problem? Okay, and I'll put this up on Canvas too. I think that this thing is helpful to you. It'll be on Tuesday next week at the Fremont campus. And uh, so I'll give 10 points for the career development. I'll give five points for this. So that's 15 points. Somebody asked about bonus points. That's 15 points, right? A bonus. And I'll be at this thing, at least in the uh, early phases of it. And don't come and say, well, I showed up at 520, but you were gone already, okay? Because um, I have to get to my, my uh, class at 6. Um, but um, I will give you credit for being at this thing. Okay? You guys transferring? Who's going to Berkeley? Anybody? Nobody going to Berkeley? San Jose State? We don't know yet. Huh? Oh. Oh, okay. Who's who's applying to Berkeley then? Okay. San Jose? Hayward? I mean East Bay, I'm from Hayward. That's, that's right. Notice I don't teach over there though, right? <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. What reputation did I leave behind right now in Hayward? John, John Lord from Hayward? No. Don't let that guy in here. Okay. Anyway, okay, so maybe I'll see some of you at some of those schools if you get over there, right? Okay. All right, guys, um, have a – that's not the end of the, of the semester. Come back. I'll see you on Monday. But um, come to this thing because you'll learn about the process for transferring, okay? All right, guys. Uh, not yet. Uh, it will be. Uh, I'll, I'll load it up there. Yeah. Right, right. Oh, yeah, right, because you were here. Yeah, I'll, I'll load it up there. Okay. Question? Okay. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. It's the same thing you did for accounting 101A. You can turn in the same thing. Yeah. But you got to print it. Don't email it to me. Yeah. Last day class. And this is a five point, right? If you come to this, it's five points. Refreshments will be served, man. Your decision. <laughs> can I bring my kids? <laughs> yeah, of course. No, you can bring your kids. I think that would be something actually kind of good for them to go to. Just like today, there was, there was no attendance on Monday either. Yeah, so it's the the, the attendance looms. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I've got some people that are, are desirous of checking out of the class. So I keep them on, keep them honest with the attendance. All right. Okay? Okay. All right. Rate of return means rate of return. Like what? What's a return? Like I just saw it's a discount, like twelve percent at the end.